What's happening here is we have a hot reservoir at 100 degrees centigrade, we have a cold reservoir at 0 degrees centigrade, and a heat conduction path between the two, but it's made out of two different materials. On the left, we have a bar of copper, which is 20 centimeters long, and to the right, we have a bar of iron, which is 80 centimeters long. And I didn't give us the uh, cross-sectional area, so let's do that. So let's say that the cross-sectional area is equal to 50 centimeters squared. So it's a small, thin bar. It's not very big. Um, so now what we're trying to find here is we're trying to find the junction temperature, the temperature at the point where the copper and the iron meet. And of course, the copper bar is a lot shorter. The iron bar is a lot bigger. And also notice that they have different conductivity constants. Copper conducts heat a lot better than, than the iron does. So how do we do that? Well, the trick here is to realize that the amount of heat being transferred on the bar has to be constant throughout the bar. It doesn't matter if the material changes. So what we can say is that the dq, dt, the amount of heat transfer on bar number one must equal the dq dt on bar number two. Now remember the equation dq dt, the amount of heat transfer, dq dt is equal to k times the cross-sectional area times the difference in the temperature between the left and the right side divided by the length of that. So what we can do then is say that the dq dt is the same in both sections. So on the left, we have k for copper. We have the cross-sectional area. We have the difference in the temperature. Now, of course, that will be from 100 to whatever the temperature is there, right there. So we'll write 100 minus t. Notice that t is, of course, going to be smaller than 100. And we divide that by uh, the length, in this case, the length is L1. We'll just leave it like that. To the right, this will be the K of the, um, of the iron times the cross-sectional area times T minus zero. Of course, we don't have to write minus zero, but just for clarity, it's a different temperature between what's over there and over there. And divide the whole thing by the length of the iron bar. Now, right away, you can see that on both sides of the equation, we have A, so we can go ahead and cancel that out. So we didn't really need to know the cross-sectional area. And next, we'll simplify this a little bit here. So what we have, let's see here. Um, we're trying to find temperature. So yeah, we do want to get rid of the parentheses. And maybe we want to cross-multiply the L. So we'll put L2 over here and L1 over here. So we say that K of the copper times L2 times 100 minus K times L2 times t. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and took the L2, put it over here, and then I multiply it times 100, and multiply it times a minus 2 to get these two terms right here. Then I go ahead and put the L1 over here, so this is equal to k of the iron times the L1 times t, and of course we don't have to uh, multiply times 0 because that would be 0 anyway. Now notice that I have two terms that have the t in it, which is what I'm looking for, right here and right there. So I'm going to take those two terms, put them on the left side, and take this and put it on the right side. So separate the variables. So that means I have a minus k L2 t minus k, and of course uh, this k right here is the k of the copper, so I better write that, otherwise I, I lose track of it. So the conductivity of copper. This k here is the conductivity of the iron times L1 times t equals, and I'll move this over to this side, I have the k of the copper times L2 times 100. All right, now I'm ready to uh, factor out the t. Also notice I have two negatives here, and of course when I move this over there, I have a negative over there. So I have negatives everywhere, which means I can probably just multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, and that makes it a positive, a positive, and a positive. Makes it a little bit easy, easier to work with. Factoring out the t, so now I now have t times k of the copper times L2 plus k of the iron times L1 is equal to, now I have k of the copper times L2 times 100. Okay, and of course, the next step would be to take what's in the parentheses and bring it to the other side, divide the right side by that quantity, and I'll do that right over here. So now I can say that the temperature is going to be equal the right side of the equation, which is k of the copper, times L2 times 100, divided by what I had here in parentheses, which is k of the copper, times L2, plus k of the iron, 
times L1. All right, now all I have to do here is play the numbers and I'll find out what that junction temperature is, T, and hopefully my answer will be somewhere between 0 and 100. If it's not, I will have made a mistake. So let's find out. So K to copper was 397. I'll go ahead and leave off all the numbers, I mean all the units, because we know that this is in centigrade degrees anyway. L2, now notice that we have an L2 in the top, L2 in the bottom, and L1 here. And I have that in centimeters. That's okay, the units will cancel out anyway, so I don't think we need to worry about that. Uh, so we go ahead and L2 would be 80. And right here we have times 100 divided by K of the copper, that's still 397, times L2, which we said was 80, plus K of the iron, which is 80, times L1, which is 20. All right, that should do it. Um, now, it looks like I have 80s. I have an 80 here, an 80 there, an 80 there, so I can simplify at least by canceling that out. Makes it a little bit easier. And with my calculator, what do we get? So it looks like I have 397 plus 20, that is uh, 417 in denominator. So it's 397 times 100 divided by 417. And that gives me a temperature of 95.2 degrees centigrade, and there's my junction temperature. Between 0 and 100, so I'm fairly confident that that is probably correct. Okay, again, the trick here is not to find the dQdt, because that's normally what we find in these cases. They're asking, typically, the question, how much heat is transferred per unit time, uh, but we're not supposed to do that. What they did ask us to do is find the junction temperature between the two materials. Um, and we do that by saying that the heat transferred to each section of that material uh, has to be the same. It's kind of like water flow. You can't just all of a sudden have some water disappear. We can't have some heat disappear. Uh, so therefore, the dQdt must be the same all the way throughout. We then set the two equations equal to each other and then solve for the unknown t. And that's how you find the junction temperature.